When you win a battle, you call it a victory. When we win a battle, you call it a massacre. It's shown that Israel is deranged. It's not normal. Why are narratives important? This is beyond anything that we have experienced. The 7th of October is simply the trigger event of the third act. This story has built up and built up in order that it is able to do the trigger work. How does Israel justify its barbarity to its own citizens, its children? They were animals. The story of Amalek was invoked. Israel has exposed itself for what it is, for the whole world to see. The current slaughter meted out on innocents in Gaza, fully supported by Western governments, is founded upon a bed of lies. It is said that the truth is the first casualty of war. Yet in this war, the truth is not hidden. In fact, the decapitated bodies, the crushed skulls, emaciated children, the callous shelling of hungry souls as they clamor for flour. All of this is known to the world, and there remains little doubt that what we are witnessing is truly horrific. Yet the Israeli counter-argument looks to subvert this truth. These images, they claim, however regrettable, are the result of such a heinous crime that they are necessary in rooting out this evil. The Gazan women and children are no more than collateral damage. I have argued that what the hypocritical West fails to see is that for every soul whose death they manufacture, the very edifice upon which they claim a moral high ground is crumbling. My guest today, Ahmed Paul Keeler, argues in a provocative and beautifully written piece that narratives really matter. This is why millions are spent on spinning a story about the state of Israel and the traducing the claims of Palestinians. Today, we take a forensic look at these narratives. A link to Sheikh Ahmed's article is available in the show notes, and I shall send it out on my Substack platform. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast on YouTube and our audio platforms and consider supporting the show by becoming a patron. Ahmed Paul Keeler, we're honored to have you back on the show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I'm very happy to be back here. It's fantastic to have you with us uh, once again. And uh, uh, I'm sure today's discussion about narratives will really clear up a lot of, I think, the confusion that's in the minds of many of us, many of our viewers, when we think about the regrettable scenes on, on our screens. Now, uh, as I said in my introduction, you've written a really evocative piece about the power of narratives. Uh, and I'm going to make reference, inshallah, to uh, this piece as we go along today. Now, you write in that article that one of the last acts in managing an indigenous people who are being replaced by a settler colony is to pen them up into, in a reservation or concentration camp. So in a way, you're positing, you're placing what we're seeing in Gaza within a historical precedent. Please tell me about this. Well, if you imagine what happened in the Americas, in, in uh, the great United States of America, where the indigenous people fought their settler colonialists for, well, for centuries. Yeah. And the final process of actually managing them when they had been defeated was to round them up and put them into reservations. And these reservations were completely controlled by the jailers, by the conquerors. Yeah. What went in, what went out, what they could do if they came off the reservation, they were in trouble. And they were basically kept in a kind of cold storage, just alive, because that was the end of the process. And this has been used uh, since then, because this was in the uh, mid-late 19th century, it was going on in America. But it was then used in the Boer War, because the British were having terrible trouble actually um, dealing with the Boers. So they broke the country up into regions and then they literally, like cattle, they brought the people into these uh, wired 
Bob Wild Reservations. Beginning of the 20th century. That was it, sort of the, and, yeah, it was, it was the end of the end 19th, 19th century, yeah. century. yeah. And it was a terrible thing. I mean, there, there was a terrible starvation. Children died, women died. Yeah. Families were destroyed. And then there was Libya, where it was used to great effect, because again, the Italians in their attempt to recreate their Roman Empire and, and take over Libya as a, as a part of their, their world. Um, they, did, they had a tremendously difficult time in quelling the resistance. So they introduced this process by which, because once you've put the people into an area which you can control, you can gradually limit their movement little by little. Gaza is just another example of this. The Gazans are in for since uh, 2007. They've been in a, in a space which has been completely controlled from air, from sea, from land, and nothing goes in or out. They are totally under the control of the occupier. So this is a, a, a horrible... Um, process which becomes inevitable when a settler colony mm -hmm. uh, is, 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 is having to deal with the final remnants, if you like, of the people that they are uh, replacing. But of course, in, in, this, in the, in the uh, case of, of, of Palestine, too many Palestinians are far too well, there's such a, um, um, an amazing culture. So what we're seeing is, is something that has happened many times. But in this particular incident, it's, well, we don't have words now any longer to describe it. That's perfectly true. Um, in your article, you talk about the final stage. Uh, now, the people of Gaza have been penned into this concentration camp since 2007, uh, yet you argue that on October the 7th, uh, uh, the opportunity was given to Israel to institute this final stage. What in your mind uh, is this final stage? Well, the final stage is, is basically uh, either you ethnically cleanse and get rid of the people or you subjugate them permanently or you kill them. That's it. There's nothing else. And what, to me, is interesting is the way that cultures, that, uh, that settler colonialist cultures and colonial cultures have used, a mechanism they have used, to enter that final gear. Because to enter that final process of, of, of total elimination, finality, it requires something tremendous. And I believe that... The 7th of October was one of these moments, but is not in any way separate. It's not in any way something that is unusual. Uh, I want to give you three beautiful examples of events which triggered a huge explosion of cruelty and death. The first one I want to talk about is Custer's Last Stand. The moment when, towards the end of the great resistance of the Sioux Indians and the, and the tribes, I call them Indians because of my generation, yeah. but the Sioux indigenous people of America. And they had been, they were in Montana, and they'd, they'd literally been um, in this last part of place where they were able to live as they could live properly. And the treaty was there with the Americans for them to stay there. Yeah. But then gold was found. And of course, the gold diggers moved in and the army moved in to break the treaty and to move them on. And they had a great warlord, a great leader in Chief Sitting Bull. He was a magnificent warrior and a very wise, very wise leader. And they came together and they... The, the, the seventh 
cavalry was sent under the command of Colonel Custer and a battle ensued and the Sioux won a great victory and the whole of that 7th troop was, was destroyed. The impact back in Washington was volcanic. This was a catastrophe. And it was not viewed, as, as um, Chief Sitting Bull said, he said, when, we, when you win a battle, you call it a victory. When we win a battle, you call it a massacre. Mm. And of course, that's how it was reported. Mm. And Custer became an emblem of heroic chivalry. His statues went up all over America. His, his paintings of, the, of this last final stand when he nobly was standing there against all these savages. And the result was, of course, that uh, a huge explosion to destroy the savages. And they sent the army and they rounded up and they went through that final process of destroying, crushing all resistance. And, and, and placing the Sioux in, in the reservations. So this is an example where that event triggered this absolute slaughter and demonization of the... In the same process, over that 20 years, the final 20 years, they, they also destroyed the buffalo. Millions of buffalo. And by the end of 20 years, they were completely gone. They had simply been massacred along with the Indians. My second example is the Sudan. And is General Gordon. And this is during the, the Mahdi War. And General Gordon in Khartoum is killed. Khartoum is overcome by the Mahdi's forces, and he's killed in, the, in, the, in, in the, the battle that takes place. And this caused an absolute uproar in London. The newspapers went crazy. Parliament went crazy. This monster had destroyed the sainted Gordon, who was a Christian maniac, and who... Um, literally became overnight the most famous man in Victorian England. And statues went up to him and pictures and paintings of him standing at the top of the steps being, being um, massacred. And of course the, the forces that had destroyed him became d d completely demonized and the big, you know, the big army was sent from Egypt down into the Sudan. And with their machine guns and everything, they destroyed the Sudanese resistance. Now, an amazing film was made just before the war when the empire mentality was completely intact. So the film shows you exactly how we were during that empire period. It's a film called The Four Feathers. It's about this man who has to regain his honor by going out and joining the forces which were going to Khartoum to revenge the death of General Gordon. And the British are such heroes. They are beautiful. You know, you feel proud to be a mem member of them. And the Arabs are, and the Sudanese, they are so cruel the horrors that you are faced with. You're seeing these brutish people. So this is the second of my examples of a moment that triggered an explosion of finality. And the third, of course, is what was called by the British the Indian Mutiny of 1857, and which was by uh, the Indians the Great Rebellion, and of course, a, a great rebellion which followed many rebellions, but was the one that very nearly succeeded. And the 
event, and I was brought up with this because, as I told you in my last, with our last visit, that you know I was educated for empire. Yeah. And the black hole of Calcutta was the most powerful image I had as a child about India. And the black hole of Calcutta basically um, was when, I'll just read it here because I, I, it's, the black hole of Calcutta refers to a prison cell which was used to hold 146 mostly British prisoners captured after the Nawab of Bengal had taken over the city from the East India Company. Interred on 20th of June 1756 in a tiny cell in Fort William, 123 of them, of the prisoners, died of dehydration and suffocation. And this became the 7th of October. Yeah. This became the moment when the Indians turned into monsters, full monsters. And the battle, the, uh, the, the re re reaction back from, from England was huge. And after the defeat of, of the rebellion, the most terrible bloodletting took place. And a great part of that bloodletting was directed at the Muslims. The last of the Mughal in, uh, uh, emperors in Delhi was deposed and sent to die in Burma. It's a terrible story. Yeah. And Delhi was decimated. The beautiful city of Delhi, a, a city of such scholarship, was destroyed. People were taken and put on, tied into, onto the end of, 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 uh, of cannons and blown up. All of, wherever you went, they said that the, the trees had people hanging from them. The summary ju justice was being going on all over the place. And for the Muslims, it was a, it was a time when the, 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 the knowledge world of Islam in India was decimated. W Charles Dickens, who you would have imagined would have taken a sympathetic view. His letter, which he wrote, which I'll read now, I couldn't believe it because I'd always been a great uh, lover of his work. But this is what he, this was his reaction to 1857. I wish I were commander in chief over there, over, over there in India. I would address that oriental character which must be powerfully spoken to in something like the following which should be vigorously translated in all native dialects. I, the inimitable, holding this office of mine and firmly believing that I hold it by the permission of heaven and not by the appointment of Satan, have the honor to inform you Hindu gentry that it is my intention with all possible avoidance of necessary, unnecessary cruelty and with all merciful swiftness of execution to exterminate the race from the face of the earth, which disfigured the earth with the late abominable atrocities. 2,000 British killed in the 1857 and Indian War of Independence. Only 2,000 compared to many, obviously, of the Indians. But that event, again, the Black Hole of Calcutta, was the trigger event. So as far as I am concerned, the 7th of October is simply the trigger event of the third act of the settler colonial project. Fantastic. I mean, and Charles Dickens was known to be a liberal reformer at home, and uh, he spoke very eloquently about uh, injustice. Absolutely. Domestically in Britain. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and in many ways, there are parallels today that you even find in the Western press. People who had hitherto been seen to be, you know, they come across as being very conscious and liberal minded people. 
uh, they've been sucked into this narrative yeah. uh, of, of October 7th. So let's talk about narratives. I mean, in your article, I think the central theme of your article is to focus on the power of narratives and establishing the correct narratives. Why are narratives important? Well, I think um, what I've just related to you yeah. are narratives. Yeah. And if you think of the 7th of October narrative, its effect is huge. It's a story that's been told, a narrative. Yeah. Now, the truth of that narrative, we will not know until this event is over. Because what we do know is that whatever happens it has been used as a framework to heap fables upon it, mm. terrible fables, to, to increase the, an idea of horror. So the 40 beheaded babies, yeah. the child in the oven, the mass rapes, all of these we know are created stories they added to the story so they built up this story has built up and built up in order that it is able to do the trigger work of unleashing and justifying the idea of a massive retribution that is the purpose of it so stories are <laughs> you know we live in stories our whole world is woven with many stories and we are telling our, each other stories all the time we are telling people uh, true stories we're telling people false stories lovely stories horrible stories it's it's uh, th that is what our, our world is made of and that's why the story is such a powerful uh, medium of communication uh, israel has its own narrative its own story um can you explain what that story is? How does Israel justify its barbarity? I think that's the only way to describe it to its own citizens, its children, and of course to the West. Well, Israel has been through a major transformation uh, in the last, say, couple of generations or even three generations. Yeah. Uh, it's a very different mindset from the the, the, the pioneers who were very aware of what they were doing they knew exactly what they were they, they knew the problems they had they knew they had to replace this indigenous community yeah they were aware of this and they were men who had some knowledge but what has happened is they have constructed a story so the ones that have followed the children who grow up now, their narrative is incredible. Because first of all, they're taught about the, the great pioneers who arrived in a land without people for a people without land. And it was a wilderness. And we made the wilderness bloom. And then they are taught that the Arabs have always hated the Jews. And they wanted to destroy the Israel in the beginning. And they have fought war after war to try to push the, uh, the Israelis into the, uh, the sea. And our heroes of the IDF have kept the invasion, the invaders out. And then the, they're, all, they're also told that the Arabs, there's, there's no such thing as Palestinians, there's, there's Arabs, these wandering Arabs, and they, they can live anywhere. They're just Arabs. Bedouins. They're, just, they're, they're Arabs. They could live anywhere in any, any Arab country. Yeah. And then the, they're told the religious story. They are the chosen people. And God has given this land of Israel from the sea to the river of Galilee. I have to be careful to do it in a different way. And they have been given this land and their return to it is, is essential because it will bring the, the Messiah. 
the return of the Messiah. So they're full of this religious zeal. Finally, they are taught from a very early age, three, four years old, they are shown pictures and they are taught about the Holocaust. They are shown how the most horrific act imaginable in human history was performed upon the Jews and that they must be ever vigilant lest it happen again. That is, that is the narratives. These are the entwined narratives that make up what a, a, an Israeli child grows up with. And they have no con and they're living in, in, in a, 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 a citadel, a walled citadel. Sealed off. Sealed off with these, you know, with towers and, and inside that citadel they have no contact with the Arabs, with the Palestinians, and outside they have no contact with the Palestinians who are in the lands that have been taken from in, in, 19, in 1967. Until their first contact is when, as young men and young women, they join the IDF and go out and police the, the lands, the West Bank, East Jerusalem. That's it. So you can imagine, they have no connection with these people. They believe these people are evil, they're dangerous, they're bad. And they have no empathy. So what is happening with their educational system is they are literally educating killers without empathy. That is the only way one can explain what we are witnessing. When on TikTok you see these kids going one, two, three, and a whole community of, of Palestinians are killed deformed, maimed. How else can you explain it? There's no empathy. They have, feel no connection. They are animals. But I wanted actually just to read that, that little section which I had, which um, explains what happened. I want to just read this section from my paper which I think, it's, and all, everything in this little section has been stated and said and delivered by Israelis. And me, most of it time and time again. Because the breaching of the citadel caused an absolute tra tra trauma suddenly the Israelis, their worst fears, were regurgitated. On October the 7th, Fortress Israel was breached by Hamas. Before this happened, the secular and religious Zionists were descending into civil war. The breach traumatized the nation and brought them together to combat the enemy. This enemy was evil incarnate, worse than ISIS, worse even than the Nazis. If they were not totally destroyed, having dealt with the Israelis, they would threaten the Jews everywhere. They were a murderous cult that existed only to kill Jews. They were animals. The story of Amalek was invoked. Their entire world was evil. Men, women, children, their animals and their homes and their farms and orchards must be destroyed. All must be destroyed. In a frenzy of killing, the IDF set about its task, cheered on by the citizens of Israel and supported 
by the USA, the UK, Germany and other Western governments. So what you describe there is really a process of indoctrination. Um, how essential to this settler colonial project is indoctrination? Absolutely essential. It's what holds it together. Because the, the state of Israel, Zionism, is a construct and it's an artificial construct. It goes against the nature of the Jew. It is something, it, it is a whole ideology that was condemned, as we talked last time, by, and has been beautifully spoken of by many of the, the, the Jewish rabbis. It's an artificial construct which actually contradicts Judaism. And as such, it has to be held together by false narratives. So that's Zionism. Then you've got the problem of the settler colonialism because that also has to justify itself through false narratives, a land without a people for a people there, all these kind of stories which are evidently not true. So you have to, this, this whole package that has been created to justify the existence of Israel that's what holds it together. I'm going to ask you something which may be regarded by some to be quite controversial, and that is the, the status of Palestinian resistance, um, whether that's through peace or through force. How do you explain Palestinian resistance? Well, it's, it's, it's like the resistance of any people, and it's the same as the, the resistance of any indigenous people who have had to suffer a settler state. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the uh, incredible thing about these, these, these settler states is most of them have succeeded. And the indigenous people, you know, most of our European settler states have succeeded. Mm -hmm. But a few, uh, very few have actually failed. One failure, of course, is Algeria. Yeah. And with Algeria, you have a situation where the French occupied Algeria for a hundred, more than a hundred years. They settled a million people in the best land. The Algerians became a, a secondary, second class citizens. They had to learn French and Algeria was incorporated by the French as a province of France. After the war, the Algerians finally rose up and they fought an eight-year war losing a million people and they won and the French had to leave. But this is a very rare example. The Libyans had to leave from their attempt to incorporate Libya into Italy because they lost the, 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 the Second World War. But this is very rare. Now, as far as uh, Palestine, it's this you resist because what what it, what happens to you what actually takes place yeah. when you are settled by an external force that almost certainly has more armaments than you have mm. what what happens to your world the most complex and the most beautiful structures on earth are the human collectivities, the human worlds, the families, the villages, the towns, the cities, all the different relationships, the history, the, the genealogies going back centuries, the different kinds of relationships, the different crafts, the different vocations. And Palestine was a, a full world of all the different vocations, the farmers and the the people of the, of the sea, the craftspeople, the scholars, merchants. You had every kind of vocation required to produce a beautiful civilization. And Palestine was a vibrant world with a deep history. And it was a world in which you had Muslims, Christians and Jews living in harmony. 
And at the heart of this you had Jerusalem, with the pilgrims coming from all over the world and being beautifully welcomed by all of the three religions. And then that the, the process of tearing that up, of destroying it, of ripping it apart, you literally, you are destroying a whole world, you're destroying a heritage, and you're destroying a future. You're destroying the economic structure, everything. The people are completely destroyed. And they're separated and they're scattered. And what do they do? They do everything they can to resist that. If they did not do that, they were, would not be human. And what comes through very clearly is that when you study these things, the, the indigenous people always show the most remarkable natural humanity. Their love of their children, their love of their families, their love of their... that They are holding on to, they are trying to maintain their worlds. Whereas the settler colonialists have to demonize them, they have to turn them into the other. Because they have to replace them. And that is all that's happening in Palestine. When you, you know, break everything down to its basic aspect, yeah. it's simply a European colonial state, settler colonial state. And it is European. The Israelis don't identify themselves with the Arabs. They just identify themselves with the Europeans. They're a part of the European song costa, so the European football all of these European things. They build houses which are European. They destroyed all the, uh, the heritage of the, of, of the uh, Palestinians. So this is why the resistance of the Palestinians, whether it be through arms or through uh, peaceful means, and they have used so much peaceful means, never reported, the peaceful means of the Palestinians is truly remarkable. Yeah. So this is where they are simply acting normally. Yeah. They're acting, you know, if you hit somebody, they're acting in the way that is normal. What is abnormal is this very strange colonial settler, colonial state that is attempting to, 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 to fix itself, but it isn't taking. And it's got its final, it's got its final process to do yeah. because it isn't finished. It's going through that horrible phrase which all of these co settler colonial states have had to put up with, which is a state of, of total destruction. And they're now going through that stage. But big problem, the whole world is watching. So you've uh, now made reference to the final stage. In your article, you talk about the three stages of settler colonial projects. Can you speak about the preceding stages to that third stage? The first stage is a stage when the settler colonials set out to civilize a barbaric world. They are going to go out and conquer, and they go and conquer what they believe to be a world that requires them to civilize. In other words, a backward world, a savage world, a, a wilderness that needs to be tamed. This is the first. So they, 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 they have to, they, it is justified on the basis that they are bringing something better. Now, nobody enunciated this more beautifully than Winston Churchill, which when he, when he applied this to Palestine, this is applied to Palestine. And he said, I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I do, admit, I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in 
and taken their place. So this is the first stage. The second stage is when this settler state decides to legalize itself and to become a legal entity. And in the case of Palestine, of course, this happened when the Americans forced through the recently established United Nations, the bill acknowledging the state of Israel. And at that point, the state, the settler state, takes on a religion, uh, takes on a, a, a judicial uh, presence, legitimacy, a legitimacy, yeah. and the indigenous people become terrorists mm. if they oppose it. They are then turned into terrorists. The third stage is when they seriously have to complete the job of dealing with the indigenous people, which we've already discussed in some detail. In your piece, uh, you end it with uh, a, uh, a warning from Lord Montague, who was in the cabinet at the time of the Balfour Declaration. Yeah. Um, please tell us about that. Warning. Well, this to me is, is a, an amazing document. Yeah. Because Lord Montague was the only Jew in the cabinet at the time of the Balfour Declaration. This is the war cabinet of Lloyd George. This is Lloyd George's cabinet. And he was a very respected minister, but he'd only recently come into Lloyd George's government. Yeah. And he was a orthodox, regular, mainstream, Jew who had been very successful and who was very highly respected in, in England. Yeah. And, his re and, and basically, it's a wonderful thing to go back to his memorandum. And he, he sent this memorandum to the government and he called it Memorandum of Edwin Montague on the anti-Semitism of the British government submitted to the British cabinet August 1917. And he said, I wish to place on record my view that the policy of His Majesty's government is anti-Semitic and in result will prove a rallying ground for anti-Semites in every country in the world. And then he went on, I'm just taking extracts from it. He said, Zionism has always seemed to me to be a mischievous political creed. And then he goes on to say, I assert that there is not a Jewish nation. It is no more true to say that a Jewish Englishman and a Jewish Moor are of the same nation than it is to say that a Christian Englishman and a Christian Frenchman are of the same nation. So basically what he is doing is he is stating the orthodox view, belief, deep belief, that as a Jew you are, it is, you are defined by your religion. You're not a race, you're not a nation, you are a member of a religion. That is what defines you. And then he goes on to say, I certainly do not dissent from the view commonly held, as I have always understood by the Jews before Zionism was invented, that to bring the Jews back to form a nation in the country from which they were dispersed would require divine leadership. And this again is the orthodox view that the return to the promised land can only take place with the coming of the Messiah, who will lead the Jews back. And then he goes on to say in that particular aspect, he says, I have never heard it suggested, even by their most fervent admirers, that either Mr. Balfour or Lord Rothschild would prove to be the Messiah. And then this is amazing how it goes on, because he says, I deny that Palestine is today associated with the Jews or properly to be regarded as a fit place for them to live in. It is quite true that Palestine plays a large part in Jewish history, but so too does it in modern Mohammedan history. And after the time of the Jews, surely it plays a larger part than any other country in Christian history. So here again, he's exploding this idea that because the, the uh, Jews were there 3,000 years ago, they had the right of it. They all have the right of it. 
And then this is really it. You see, it seems to be inconceivable that Zionism should be officially recognized by the British government and that Mr. Balfour should be authorized to say that Palestine was to be reconstituted as the national home of the Jewish people. I do not know what this involves, but I assume that it means that Mohammedans and Christians are to make way for the Jews. And he finishes on this, well, this is the last extract I've got, which is, when the Jews are told that Palestine is their national home, and you will find, he said, very importantly, every country will immediately desire to get rid of its Jewish citizens. Just remember, this is before the Holocaust. Yeah. And you will find a population in Palestine driving out its present inhabitants, taking all the best in the country. Now, what is so important about that was that the British government was presented with a very clear picture of this ideology that at that time was very small. It was only because the British government took it out that it started getting credibility. Before that, it was a very, very marginal thing. And this man, in his amazing memorandum, because it's much, I mean, we could talk about this memorandum, for, you know, for a, for a whole session. But the, the fact of the, is that he presented people with the normal, the normality situation of what would happen if this thing got launched. So right from the very beginning, the whole artificial structure of the thing was laid bare by Lord Montague. But they didn't listen to him. Finally, um, Ahmed, um we have seen a shift in attitude towards Israel, and you mentioned that in our last program. Um, how can Muslims work to place that change within, uh, in perspective? Like, how do we understand that shift? Is it a temporary shift? Is it a, a shift that, we've, we, uh, that may be easily be reversed? Um, yeah, what's going on? But I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, the narrative and how it's moved on since October the 7th. I think that we're at a, a, an extraordinary point where October the 7th, triggering this final phase, has completely exposed Israel. Yeah. It's shown that Israel is, de is deranged. It's not normal. If, if this was a human being, they would be in a hospital. Yeah. It's a deranged operation that is taking place. Yeah. People are deranged. Those young people who are doing this, this killing, it's beyond imagination. You can understand uh, Palestinian, the resistance of, 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 uh, of, of, uh, of the indigenous people, but this is something horrifying. But it is the inevitable final phase of the settler, settler colonial project. But it has, it has a kind of, because of the scale of it, because of, you know, bombing this horrible, as I do in my piece, I show the, the, the horrifying nature of the actual bombing. We, we, were, we, were, we are revolted by the fact that they had no defense. You know, they call it a war. How could it be a war when there's no defense from, these, from the air? And they just, the, bomb, the bombs have been coming down 150 days, day and night. A whole generation of children are going to be totally traumatized. We watched this. We, we are 15 miles away. There is food in, in lorries, and there are children starving and dying of starvation. This is, this is beyond anything that we have experienced. So... The first thing is that Israel has exposed itself for what it is, for the whole world to see, for the world to be stunned by what is happening. The second thing is that there is amazing uh, voices coming out, Jewish voices of historians who went through the whole business of, of, of Israel yeah. and came out the other side and saw this thing for what it was. And you've got the Orthodox Jews, those Jews, those wonderful Jews who have remained uh, God-centered. 
and who have always condemned this artificial thing. And you've got uh, young Jews who are awakening to what is happening. And you've got people of every kind looking at it. And most important of all, you've got the resonance of all those worlds that were colonized for a while or had to suffer settler colonization. You've got all those people of the world who suffered the European grandiose transformation of the world. You've got those people being reminded of what happened to them. So the whole colonial horror that took place over the last two, three, four hundred years from South America through Africa and Asia is coming back again into people's ma imaginations and knowledge. The world can never be the same after this. This is a, a moment of such crisis for the West because the West has to come to terms with what has happened. The West has to recover from what, he, what, what has taken place. There has to be a rebirth of consciousness in the West because you cannot deny what is happening before your eyes. You cannot deny the horror of the scale of the horror that is actually taking place and is being perpetuated. So I think it's happening. The change is happening. We are witnessing it. And inshallah, God protect us inshallah. in this time and God protect the Gazans and God protect the, the Israelis because this sickness is a terrible thing to view. It's a terrible thing to see people undergoing this transformation into a kind of a, a, a killing machine without empathy. It's terrible. So there should be, from those who are outside who can see what is happening, there should be a huge outpouring of compassion to surround what is happening, to bring it to a halt, to end it.